It may seem unusual for me to start with assessment because we usually think of assessment as one of the things that comes along um, further down in our process. But I find when um, designing and planning a course uh, uh, that it's actually better to start by thinking about well, what are the desired outcomes and not just what are what are those outcomes, but what's the nature of them? Because thinking through that can really help us think through strategies that we can use <clears throat> and then um, the nature of those strategies, the nature of the knowledge that we want our students to work through. Um, and then that helps inform like, okay, what are assessment strategies as well as what are the technologies that we want to use um, to help build that learning. So I'm going to start us with assessment and then we'll get into instructional strategies and then from there we'll get down into um, assessment strategies and uh, technology selection. So here we go. <clears throat> So in day one, I talked about um, all of these moderating variables, and I'm just going to situate today's conversation in these areas. Um, when we talk about assessment, assessment has a significant impact on uh, the quality of online learning and what we do, how we plan around this. Um, uh, it's such a major driver in the instructional design process. So it touches on everything from not just what is the role of assessment, but what's the source and the nature of feedback? Um, feedback as an aspect of assessment is really important. And it even starts to really suggest to us what are our pedagogies. Uh, so I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time uh, down in this space as we talk about assessment. Let's start with frameworks for types of assessment and alignment. If you are not already familiar with this, you may be, but I think it's helpful to use something like Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, and this was revised uh, somewhat recently by Anderson and Crathwall, um, but we still refer to it as Bloom's Taxonomy, which breaks learning down into different types of learning. And while there's some um, foundational relationships between these, like it's hard to uh, apply or analyze something that you don't remember or understand, I want to make sure that even though we work with these in different ways, that we don't walk away with the impression that one is better than the other. They're just, they're really just different types of learning and they all have to take place in order for a learner to uh, begin to learn new information, to comprehend new principles, to be able to apply that and actually do something with that through application or analysis or evaluation or creation. So um, so let's use Bloom's taxonomy as a way to organize this. I think you can also organize your learning outcomes or learning objectives using Bloom's taxonomy. But depending on the nature of the learning outcome, we use different types of assessments to assess the learning outcome. So um, up here I've listed uh, very typical types of measures of learning. Um, all of the different types of assessment that we administer can generally fall into measuring recall, retention, transfer, and application, which is really far transfer. So if you have learning outcomes or learning objectives that fall under remember or understand, you're really going to be assessing that with assessments that assess recall and retention. That's things like tests and quizzes, short answer, maybe long answer um, to look at understanding and reasoning or something like that. Uh, but if you want your students to do application or analysis or evaluation, any of these other types of learning outcomes in Bloom's taxonomy, then you'll want to use assessments that help you measure transfer and application. Um, so let's get into the specifics of what that means. <clears throat> So here I'm borrowing um, Stiggins and Conklin and Chapri and Stiggins as well, and kind of overlaying this on uh, Bloom's taxonomy or merging these two frameworks together. Stiggins and colleagues breaks it down in breaks uh, learning down into knowledge, reasoning, skills, 
products and disposition. So here we start to get a little bit into attitudes and affect as well. Knowledge are facts and concepts. So that's just like uh, what we were talking about earlier, remembering and understanding. Typically we use selected response, multiple choice, true, false, things like that. Maybe some fill in the blank or short responses. For reasonings, now we want to know what students, um, that students use what they know to reason and solve problems. How do they work their way through a problem or an issue or a concept? So for this, for assessment, we would assess reasoning through like constructed responses or extended responses. I'll give you some examples here in a bit. For skills, uh, now we're asking students to use their knowledge and reasoning to perform a task skillfully. So of course, by the time we're here, we're assuming that they have some foundational knowledge and reasoning and that they can then perform a task skillfully. In order to assess skills, uh, we use performance assessments or demonstrations in order to assess those skills. Sometimes we want students to generate products based on their knowledge, reasoning, and skills. Um, so for example, I teach design and uh, oftentimes my students are producing design documents, uh, an analysis document, uh, maybe they're putting together an educational learning website or an, a, a uh, learning plan or something like that. Um, those are products where they bring their knowledge, reasoning, and skills together to produce a product. So we assess that by having students produce a product, uh, which typically we then evaluate with a rubric or uh, some sort of uh, scale uh, to evaluate different components and the quality of those. And then finally, you may have dispositions. You may be interested in looking at students' attitudes or beliefs about a given domain or expectations. And for that, we can use a range of things to uh, assess student dispositions. That may be communications, either directly with us or in class, through discussions, um, maybe more formally communicated through interviews or having students keep journals or document reflections. A quick note, I get a lot of questions about um, proctoring. And I think we need to situate proctoring appropriately. Um, the types of tests or assessments that get proctored are tests that largely measure knowledge um, and maybe to some extent reasoning. So proctoring is really focused around these types of assessments. Um, and those may be auto-graded assessments, uh, or, or you may also be interested in having like auto-graded assessments and adaptive learning systems, but keep in mind that those largely operate at this level. So when you're using these types of assessments, you're usually measuring knowledge and reasoning. That conflicts with then, you know, I get questions about, well, how do, but how do I know if a student can really take this and apply this? Well, that's a whole different method of assessment. Um, so that's why we need to look at other assessment methods. And here we can even uh, use the idea of authentic assessment, which means um, there's a lot more focus on application and authentic sim simply means it's, more, it's closer to what's expected on the job and in real life. So for example, a student in a uh, business class may produce a uh, rough draft of a business plan, just like they might in real life. Um, so students in education, uh, I'm sorry, in civics, might uh, be asked to um, produce some things or analyze some things, just like they might actually do either in real life as part of their uh, engagement, uh, civic engagement as a citizen, um, or as part of their engagement, say, on a job, if they're an elected official or in a volunteer capacity or something like that. And I raise this because authentic assessment helps a lot with relevance, uh, which helps address motivation, because I get questions a lot too about, well, but how do I motivate my students? 
Um, well, how we think about how we're assessing them, like what are we teaching them? How are we assessing them? How are we going to engage them in a way that's um, more authentic can be one of those ways where you can address motivation through designing assessments and activities and learning opportunities that are more authentic. Uh, in other words, more relevant to what they would do on the job or in real life. And I'm just overlaying Bloom's taxonomy up here. So when we talk about like objectives that fall under like remembering facts or understanding concepts or principles, um, applying or analyzing or evaluating, creating products. And then there's the affective domain that really relates to uh, dispositions as well. Um, these all map together. Okay, so what are some specifics? All right, so in the knowledge domain, you can assess mastery of discrete elements of knowledge, such as history facts, spelling words, uh, maybe foreign language vocab, parts of plan plans, like what are the parts of a plan? You know, what are the three branches of government in the United States <laughs> or something like that? Um, reasoning, uh, we're starting to assess blocks of knowledge rather than pieces of detached information. So here we may be looking at like causes of environmental disaster, um, the carbon cycle in the atmosphere, how a mathematical equation can be derived from another, the concepts of checks and balances in the government, um, helping to identify, oh, sorry, and this helps us to identify whether a student has strong reasoning or problem solving skills. Um, this is also key to starting to move knowledge from what we call inert knowledge, which is really just, they know something, they, it's, it, they remember a fact or a detail, but they can't actually do anything with that knowledge. Um, designing instruction to facilitate reasoning and assessing them on that reasoning helps them start to move that knowledge from inert to active. For skills, we're looking, this determines, um, assessment around skills determines whether a student can skillfully complete a task or perform in a desired manner. So for example, this may be like mixing chemicals correctly uh, or engaging in skilled debate or holding a conversation a foreign language or making a decision in a legal base based on constitutional law. Um, so you more than likely in civics education, have some instances where you want students not just to show you what they know, but apply that knowledge as well through the demonstration of specific skills. You may also have instances where you want students to produce a product. Um, for products, uh, the assessment of products determines whether a student can create a product, a tangible thing, based on what they have learned. These might include like a business plan or a presentation that they have to give or a speech, a lab report, a health and fitness plan, a balanced checkbook register, a creative work of art, or even a news article or producing a broadcast. Um, I have some of my students actually produce uh, opinion. Uh, op-eds, uh, opinion editorials that might go in a newspaper. I also have them generate policy briefs. So what they do is they look at, you know, existing uh, research or whatever around a related idea and then construct a policy brief to support policymakers and decision makers. So um, chances are in civics education, there's quite a bit of different products that they might be able to generate to help demonstrate their learning. And then finally, dispositions. Assessment of dispositions gathers information about a student's dispositions and their ability to reason and allows you to probe more deeply. So you could use interviews or have students keep journals that you read and respond to. You could pose them open questions during instruction or during a live class session um, and uh, that prompt them to share their beliefs or feelings or attitudes about something, or you could even, you know, use oral exams for that. So this is all about what we are assessing. Now let's talk about how you might assess that, in particular in an online setting. 
Um, so using the same structure, let's talk through this. For knowledge, um, you could use like quiz or test tools uh, to test objective items. That's very common because they're very easy to put together. But as we've seen, um, they're best used for assessing this type of knowledge. This is a bad match for assessing other types of knowledge. Um, you may even want to explore the use of like audio voice threads, say for like language instruction, uh, you, you know, where students maybe practice pronunciations or vocabulary, or they could do recitations where they record something that has to be memorized and then they submit that recording, um, or they do that live during a Zoom session or something. Um, but these are pretty basic online assessment tools. Let's get into the more uh, complex and, and, and interesting stuff. For reasoning, you could use quiz or test tools um, because a lot of those do provide for open-ended items, but that of course means you can't do auto grading on those. Um, so they do require time. Um, you could have students do like a sorting activity where either uh, in your LMS or maybe you give them a PowerPoint or a Word document where they have um, different words or squares with different things in there where they have to sort uh, different uh, concepts uh, and organize their knowledge. And that gives you a sense of, you know, well, are they really understanding concepts? How are they organize, organizing this? Are they putting like ideas with other like ideas? Um, can they sort a process into the right flow? Uh, can they sort uh, you know, if I give them examples of X or Y or Z, can they sort those examples under different category labels? So sorting activities are a great way to really start to understand students, um, what we call their cognitive schema. You know, what's the organization in their mind for these concepts and how, how good are they at that really? And these are great both as activities as well as as assessments. So you can use them as just active learning um, and you can use them as assessments. Uh, you could also have students record solving a problem and then submit that recording, or you could have them solve a problem uh, live during a Zoom session and, and uh, provide them immediate feedback as well. This is a great strategy, especially like in engineering or math or the sciences or things like that. Having students write a paper on a topic really falls under reasoning uh, most of the time. Most of the time what they're having to do in a paper is reason their way through something. Um, they could put together a presentation on a topic. And again, that could be either recorded and submitted as an assignment or shared in a discussion forum or even done live in a whole class setting. Um, and then you could also use case studies requiring students to apply course content and derive a solution. Uh, in one of my own classes, I actually use a series of case studies that students go through. It's a fully asynchronous class, um, but they go through and they analyze different features. And based on the case studies, I have them making recommendations and then we talk about those recommendations and um, I have them derive a plan for how they would handle that, pretending, you know, as if they were a consultant consulting with that company. So again, there's some of that authenticity. For skills, it's gonna be a lot of the same thing. You could have students record themselves performing a skill like a lab or an exercise routine or a talk aloud in their design or a decision-making process or you could have them perform that skill during a live video session, um, such as labs or uh, facilitate like a small group meeting where uh, they have to get together and do a debate or they have to simulate or engage in role playing. Um, we've had a couple of classes that featured uh, role playing uh, during a live chat where students were assigned different roles. One was a role where they, uh, a simulation where they had to um, decide on uh, whether or not to build a nuclear power plant. And we started actually with looking in Germany at a location in Germany. And then we looked at a location in Virginia in the United States. So that could allow us to compare different features and why one might decide differently depending on contextual and cultural variables. 
But as part of that, the students were assigned to different roles as well. So some of them had to play the role of um, uh, uh, different energy sources besides nuclear energy. So for example, they had to, one of them had to pick to be a startup of like a green technology like wind or solar um, and then advocate for their position on this. Some of them had to take on the role of different government agencies or elected representatives for that region um, or stakeholders who live in the area and would be impacted by that. And so um, we spent time, um, first of all, just um, having them define their role, explore it and make a statement, a position statement um, for their particular stakeholder group. And then uh, we had a follow on session where the different stakeholder groups had to get together and try to negotiate a resolution and see if they could agree upon a uh, specific and detailed proposal or recommendation for building a nuclear power plant. And another class we did role playing around um, uh, working with parents who have learners with uh, learning or physical disabilities. So we would have a student take on the role of the parent. We would have another student take on the role of a principal and another student take on the role of the teacher and another the role of the, the student and so on and so forth. And then we would give them an hour, just like they have in a school setting to meet and talk through and generate uh, what's called an IEP, an individualized education plan for that student. So simulations and role playing can be, uh, e definitely can be done online. Um, they can be live or asynchronous and they can be very engaging and also give you an opportunity to really see, do your students understand um, and how well are they applying the knowledge and the reasoning and the skills that they've been learning. For products, um, you know, this may seem a lot more familiar because of course we hear about like Google Docs and things like that all the time. You could have students complete a project either individually or as a group um, and then submit that. I have students completing products all the time that they submit, whether that's like, like I said, a design document um, where they have analyses as part of that, or maybe they've built a website for librarians or for teachers or something. Sometimes they do that individually, sometimes they do that as a group. Um, it just depends on um, the scope and uh, the nature of what I really want the students to get out of it. You could also have students, um, and I'm generating some examples here, like construct a writing sample individually or together, um, or on a wiki or a Google Doc. A, a Google Doc is really just a, a wiki uh, that's really advanced at this stage. Um, but we're actually going to be doing a product, uh, generating a product like that as part of our workshop uh, on one of the days where I have us, instead of just discussing things, we're going to generate a resource together, a collective resource together that ideally we can, you, you, you feel like you could turn around and continue to use that well after this workshop is over. I find having students create products um, whether that's as a weekly activity or as an actual assessment um, really helps bridge that gap between what they're learning in a class and how they can take that and apply that in their real life or on the job. For dispositions, um, there are usually a lot of great tools for students to maintain a reflection journal throughout the class. Some learning management systems have reflection journals built into them um, and you can use them there. If you don't happen to have one, um, having students use Google Docs or writing it up in a word processor and submitting that to you um, through the LMS or through email or whatever, that all works just as well. You can also use personal communications. So maybe small groups or some one-on-one -on -one conversations or um, even setting up a discussion in your class and having students respond to it there. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can use different communications throughout the class as well to assess dispositions.